We have been benefited by three completed phase three trials and one, I think, important phase two trial, randomized trial, that have demonstrated the efficacy of these compounds, the PARP inhibitors, in women who have had a response to platinum. These trials all fit under the concept of switch maintenance, which is the idea of giving a patient a platinum-based regimen, seeing a response, and at the point of maximal response, which was defined in the trials as somewhere between four and eight cycles of treatment, where the patients were randomized to a PARP inhibitor or a placebo. And then they were monitored for first progression. And there's a many other exploratory endpoints that have been studied in these trials, but those were the, kind, the primary um, outputs for, for all of these trials. The first of these four trials, it was actually a randomized phase two, and it was a large one. It's called study 19, and it involved a capsule formulation of Olaparib. But while it was undergoing a, a, an evaluation to switch from the many capsules that needed to be taken to a tablet formation, which was more potent or more, more concentrated, a large study was done where they randomized patients who had had this platinum sensitivity to either Olaparib versus placebo. And it was, I have to say it was like almost earth shattering for us because we had never seen in a randomized trial the hazard ratios as low as they showed in this particular trial. And what we saw was that when they went back retrospectively and found the patients that actually had germline mutation, we saw hazard ratios that were less than 0.2. We have, as I said, we've never seen something like that. Now, again, we had known that these drugs should work in BRCA patients, but this was done in all comers. And it was assessed by investigators and found that this drug seemed to almost double the time to progression in patients who had received it instead of receiving placebo. This data was actually brought to the FDA and underwent a full ODAC review. And because of a number of, I think, pretty important points, the ODAC recommended against approval of it in, as a maintenance. One of the major reasons that they uh, that the FDA or the ODAC opined against the drug was that there was an ongoing trial, SOLO2, which was a phase three trial in, in a more selected patient population that I'll talk about in a minute, uh, which uh, they didn't want to con potentially confound the results, which made sense. But only about four months later, we actually got the, uh, the treatment approval of the, of the, of the compound Olaparib, as I mentioned earlier, in fourth line and beyond patients who carried a germline. So that kind of story was evolving back in 2014, and we were pretty happy with that. Ongoing at the time, though, were two other um, trials, excuse me, three other trials, um, and the first of which to report was the NOVA trial. And this was looking at another PARP inhibitor, inhibitor called Niraparib. This trial uh, was set up in a, in, a, in a similar way in that it took, to study 19, in that it took all comers, but it had really embedded two trials in one. In one cohort, they were looking specifically at the germline cohort of patients, patients who had a germline mutation in BRCA. And in the second was everybody else. And that included patients who had a somatic mutation, those who had what was called homologous recombination deficiency, but not due to BRCA and then those patients that were wild types, so they were negative for everything. So two embedded trials, and in these trials they were using what's called a blinded independent central review for radiology. So all of the imaging studies were sent out and they were reviewed externally. And they reported on the results of this at a meeting that occurred in uh, 2016 at the European Society of Medical Oncology. And this again, it, it was, while it was um, a big news event, Many of us who have been watching this field expected this to be a very positive trial, particularly in the patient population who matched what we saw in the study 19 with Olaparib. But it was an important advance. It was a phase three trial, it was adequately powered, and it demonstrated clearly that in the patient population that are most vulnerable to these drugs, that they work, and they work big. So the hazard ratios were quite small. They were 0.2, uh, in between 0.2 and 0.3. And for the groups that were, um, that were less strictly defined, so those that had the homologous recombination deficiency or somatic BRCA mutation and had the, uh, or, or, or were wild type, 
that they also seem to benefit. And I think what was most surprising, there are two, I think, interesting factors from that trial. One was that the patients that were not germline, were not somatic, were not HRD, so they were pure wild type, large patient population, about half the, of the cohort in that group, still seemed to benefit. And what that tells us is that our tests for assessing homologous recombination deficiency probably still are not perfect, and they still need to be further optimized. In that particular trial, they used a, an assay that looked at three components uh, to determine whether or not homologous recombination deficiency was present, but it obviously still is not perfect. The other um, important finding, which also recapitulated one of the earlier trials I mentioned with the root capper of looking at uh, somatic and germline was that if you looked at the somatic mutation in the, in the NOVA trial and you looked at the germline patient in the NOVA trial, they had overlapping, really overlapping PFS curves. Was suggested that a, and it was make sense because a germline patient likely has a somatic event and a somatic patient without a germline one would have the same mutation. So we expected to see that those were the case, but it confirmed that initial observation that was seen um, and uh, ultimately reported with the 2016 approval of, of Rucaparib. And one of the major toxicities that we were all very concerned about, and it did come to the table when ODAC was reviewing study 19 with Olaparib, was what is the risk of a secondary malignancy? For instance, the MDS, AML. Those um, secondary malignancies were actually very low and continue to be reported very low across all of the phase three trials that have been done, which is reassuring that that particular risk didn't seem to occur, despite the fact that many of these patients had very low, prolonged exposure to the drugs. So that was good. The second thing we learned is that, and, and this will, I think, emerge when we start talking about all of the phase three trials, was that they had a little bit of a difference and some similarities in terms of the toxicities. So for NOVA, what we saw for niraparib was that there was a high degree of, of GI side effects, which is what we would expect to see and have seen with every one of the trials that we've done. What we saw a little bit higher rate of in this trial was more myelosuppression, uh, predominantly in the form of thrombocytopenia. And many people were, I guess, a little uh, alarmed with this um, because that is an event that, you know, uh, especially the grade three, four thrombocytopenia does cause the need for some type of medical intervention, at least, and if nothing else, uh, closer surveillance. But it's interesting when you go back and you look at the trials that were done establishing the maximum tolerated dose of the drugs, that they all had very similar types of problems with myelosuppression when they received high doses. And so I think that with NOVA, and the niraparib dose that maybe they're at, at, at an upper, upper limit or an upper end of the, the tolerability of that drug. And as it turns out in some of the subsequent reports that have been done on NOVA, that about a third of the patients can stay at the dose that they started and two thirds of the patients require some reduction or interruption. And most of them, it's basically a third, a third, a third. A third are at 300, a third at 200, and a third are at 100. So there does need to be some um, uh, attention paid to the tolerance of, 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 of these drugs um, as patients go forward. So that trial uh, did, uh, was filed with the FDA. We were expecting a, an answer for their approval in June and by surprise in March 27th, we actually did receive approval that the, that the drug was approved not only in the germline patient but in all comers. So it removed the need to assess for HRD by one of the tests as I mentioned and it became then available to us to use in patients in the switch maintenance setting. Now while that was cooking, SOLO2 had also, uh, around that time, actually just a couple weeks before, had, had reported at the SGO meeting. SOLO2 was a trial that was done very similar to the study 19, but in the germline patient population. So NOVA, all comers, SOLO2, germline BRCA. That trial also enrolled patients after a platinum response, but it was assessed by the, their response was assessed by the investigators. So NOVA used a bicker, SOLO2 used the investigators. And they were both looking for pro progression-free survival. And as we saw and expected to see in SOLO2, that patients that were randomized to um, Alaparib, the tablet formulation versus placebo, that these patients had a dramatic improvement in the delay for progression, much like we saw in study 19. Very 
low hazard ratio. Again, quite reassuring. And again, in a spectrum of, 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 of um, activity that we had never seen before until they started to show up with us as, as, as these PARP inhibitors. So we were quite uh, happy to see that. It was confirmatory. Um, when we looked at the adverse events on the SOLA2 trial, we saw very similar side effects that we would have seen across all PARP inhibitors. So again, GI toxicity, taste changes, weight loss. These are very common side effects that we see with the PARP inhibitors. What we didn't, I wouldn't say didn't expect to see, but we did, what was noted was that there were higher rates of anemia um, than, than um, we might have anticipated. But again, the high degree of anemia, the grade 3-4 rates, were actually relatively consistent across all of the, all of the compounds.